I'm Mel Stewart, and this is Swim Swam Podcast. Joining us today is perhaps one of the most interesting men in swimming. He's a breaststroker, but we won't hold it against him because he's an NC2A champion and an Olympian today, ladies and gentlemen, Clark Burkle. Hello, hello. I like the breaststroke part there because I, I don't blame you, honestly. I mean, we're probably the weirdest species out there. So it took me a while to figure it out, but now I totally understand. So, I, I, All my roommates are breaststrokers. Uh, at least once a week, I have to say that, that I have to give breaststrokers a hard time. But here's the thing, buddy. There would be no butterfly if it wasn't breaststroke. Butterfly exactly. came out, but was born from, it wasn't even an event. It's because breaststrokers tried to get funky with the stroke and suddenly they go, okay. We'll make that butterfly. Yeah, no, I I actually remember the first time that I learned that. I was up at uh, Lakeside, and I was watching a master swim meet, and I was watching this person do this really weird rendition of butterfly. And I was like, why is that guy kicking breaststroke? (laughs) And my dad had to explain it to me. So I I guess, you know, you're right. Not one without the other. (laughs) Well, let's, 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 let's talk about family. You've got, you got deep roots in swimming. Um, you know, your sister is an Olympic bronze medalist, two-time NC. She won NC2A championships, 200 free, 500 free, correct? Well, you guys yeah, were at yeah. Florida. Look yep. at you trying to remember because you're yeah, like, I, I don't know. Well, I know she won the 500 because that one's like emblazoned in my mind. I mean, she won by like almost a length. And then the 200, I mean, um, obviously that was – she was really good at that event, but it was so comp- – I mean, it's always competitive. But um, – Plus, in my mind, it's nicer if she's only won one because I've only won one. And so then I feel, <laughs> feel even with her. But no, she, uh, she, she did win too. <laughs> Is she one year older? She's uh, 20 months. So she's June of uh, 1986. And I'm, um, sorry, Carolyn, I'm uh, February of 88. So here's the big question. Could she beat you for a very long time? And was there a certain age where you could beat your sister? And that was like better than any accomplishment on earth. That's a, that's a good question. It's kind of a, um, I guess it's a, in, you know, a, an interesting answer because when we were younger, um, she, she grew before I did, but she never beat me. Just, I, I don't know. I, I was a lot more competitive than she was. Um, I think she had like a more competitive spirit deep down, but didn't really show it. She was a little bit um, more into just the social side of going to practice. And I was always younger and kind of moving up at the same rate she was. So whenever she'd go to a group, I'd go to a group. So I was always really young and um, was generally disliked, I think, by a lot of um, my older teammates, just uh, kind of a pest, trying really too hard in practice, whatever. but I remember this distinct moment. It's a sectional meet that Lakeside actually hosted at uh, the Mary T. Monitor pool, which is um, you know, our indoor pool here in town. And she did really, really well and like made all these cuts and stuff. And at that point in time, I realized like how much better than me she was. Um, and I think that gave her a lot of confidence. And then, you know, I, I caught up and I got better than her after that again. And then um, her freshman year of college at SEC, she went like 144 back when that was just blazing fast on the leadoff leg of uh, the woman's four by two uh, when they broke I think, on six sixteen, which used to be really fast too. And I remember watching that and my best time at the time was one forty four. She had just dropped four seconds and I was like, you know, what the F this is ridiculous. I cannot get you by my sister. And at the time I had high school States a week later um, and she swam the 500. I think that her freshman year in four thirty eight, And that was also my best time. So um, at that point in time, I realized that it, I had a challenge in front of me and I, I dropped time at high school meet, but I mean, you know, most 16 year old guys aren't expecting their 18 year old sister to, to be able to go the same time as in the 200 and 500 free. So, so for a long time, she was, um, she was faster or as fast as I was much better, technically uh, much prettier freestyle, much more efficient, much better racer than I was, but, um, you know, I was tenacious in practice. So I, 
<laughs> I'd beat her in practice, but man, in meets, she was something else. So it was kind of a, a switch back and forth, and um, especially in freestyle. But, you know, I it, she was just always so gifted, and everybody would remind me of it. So, <laughs> so it was... You, you come from you come from really tight family, and uh, I remember uh, at the, at, in two thousand eight when she was in, when everybody was at the Olympics and you were there. I remember you being there, and it yeah. was uh, and I was like, I remember it was like it was me and it was uh, a guy who used to head up the USA Swimming Foundation. We were just hanging with your parents and you, and I was like, I remember sitting back going, "Wow, this is a special, this is a tight knit, great family," and. Um, I, I wonder how often people. I wonder how often you realize when you got when you when you're in a family like that. If you're aware that maybe not all families are quite like this. Yeah, I don't know when that particular um, emotion set in. I, I don't know. I guess you're so lost in it sometimes. You just think that that's the norm. But um, you know, I, I appreciate you realizing that. I mean, we we are close, but at the same time, each one of us is. I mean the the thing about the Burkles is everybody's so competitive. I, you can't really tell. I sit, my dad sits right here. This is our office. He sits like right and stares at my computer screen all day. And it's just the best thing ever. But you know, there's days where him and I are, um, and we're, you know, he's allowed me, he's given me the opportunity to partner with him and learn a lot from him. But there's days where, you know, I can't wait to get out of this room. And there's other days where it's the most special experience of my life, you know? And, um, and I think that's something that's unique to our family is, we could be out playing around to golf. And I mean, my mom could be secretly wanting to beat me and I could be secretly wanting to beat her. And it's just, but at the same time, we're having such a, such an enjoyable experience. So, I mean, we were really close. Um, you know, we did, my dad really values family. I think that's, um, you know, a part of that is just from his upbringing, not necessarily having that closeness. Um, he has two other siblings. His parents were divorced early you know, he started his own business when he was 15 or 16 and he just, um, you know, he didn't swim to, to make the Olympic team. He swam because he wanted to work out and, and, you know, be a part of Lakeside, but he worked to support his mom and to, you know, make money for himself and whatnot. And so he always saw that his family wasn't always together, I think. And so he made sure we had family dinners, um, every night, uh, we weren't allowed to be in our room with our doors closed if it wasn't like bedtime. Um, so we, so we always like spent a lot of time together. Um, I had a strict curfew and my sister is actually quite a couch potato. So we ended up spending a lot of weekends together on, you know, watching TV, whatever it may be. And since we swam in the same group pretty much our entire lives, I mean, a lot of her boy, you know, first boyfriend was one of my good friends. And, um, so we always kind of had this, like, we just knocked around in the same group. Um, and you know, we, we stayed close, but I think like what, sort of brought us all together was just this like competitive spirit and just liking sports. I mean, both my parents, my mom played tennis at IU, dad swam at U of L. Um, they got us started at an early age. And, uh, you know, from there we all just kind of stuck tight. And like, I, I was so excited. I got to go to Beijing. Um, I remember I've, I've got this picture actually, you're, you're like kind of in the background. It's like in the stands there. Um, and just being able to watch all that and like, you know, meet people through her that were like my swimming idols. And like, I was always such a swim nerd and, um, she just like, didn't care, care as much about that side of it and didn't understand why I'd get so excited. Um, it was, it was just great. So like, I, you know, that was a special experience for us. And like my dad always made sure he took, took us everywhere, but also that, uh, my parents could come to all of our meets. Um, you know, they didn't, they weren't the type of parents that like sit there at every practice, but they would definitely make it to our meets. Um, and my dad, you know, his, his dad, I think watched him swim maybe a few times, his mom pretty much never. So I think a lot of it stemmed from that, but yeah, it made us all, um, part of this, this pretty tight knit group. And we still, you know, we're still pretty tight to this day, even though Caroline's out in California, my brother's, um, finishing up at UK in Lexington, but now I see my parents all the time. So it's a, yeah, it's special, but I, I don't know, like realizing that other people won't like that. I mean, it probably wasn't until I was older and realize that like not everybody loves swimming as much as we did. And there's a chance my dad pops in here and like busts through. So if he does, I'll see. I texted him and told him I was doing this, but um, I think I just heard him. So we'll see. It just out of curiosity, was, uh, I think your dad's a little bit older, but was he a contemporary of um, Mary T? I texted you. I told you I was uh, jumping on this. Yeah, this is your call. I'm just 
It's it's Mel Stewart. I'm doing oh, hey, Mel. Call. I didn't recognize you, Mr. Perkle. You look so professional. He is. <laughs> I'm just. I'm, I'm so I'm, impressed. I'm just you trying. Look like I'm just, you look like a damn banker. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to keep up, buddy. I'm trying to keep up. How you been doing? How you been doing? I've been I've been doing pretty well. I just I was just asking a question. Are are you are you a contemporary of Mary T or are you a little bit older? I'm a little older. I'm 63, and um, Mary T came. I, I know Mary T well, um, but Mary T came in. Denny was our Denny Persley was my coach. Wow. And I was in college, and you know, towards the end of my career or whatever, swimming I was good. It wasn't really a career like. You're a Clark cat. <laughs> I looked up to guys like you all. Um, but anyway, I'll never forget because we were training and it was me and like three college guys and we were all butterflies. And back then, as you can imagine, everybody, all you did was train butterfly. And so we're training butterfly and all of a sudden, said. Denny gets this little 11, 12 year old girl in our lane, Lisa Beasy. And Lisa just starts kicking our ass. And she's fast. And we're doing like 2200s butterfly. Denny believed in these long sets, 4,000s. And so she's killing us. And then all of a sudden, this is when I got to the end of my career. All of a sudden, he says, well, guess what? I got a girl who's better than Lisa. And it was Mary T. <laughs> and that's what I said. I can't keep up with a 12-year-old girl. <laughs> <laughs> Little did I know what you know how good she would become. So, we're yeah, I was older. I was probably early 20s so almost almost nine years older probably something like that i say for, for we got a lot of people who don't pick this up on video if you're just listening to this as a download we're talking to clark burkle's father oh. mr burkle <laughs> who was a butterflyer so so i uh i mean we're talking about mary t maher I matt against matt vogel remember matt of course of course i don't know yeah. matt vogel yeah. matt Vo so here you go uh, we'll, he we'll was bring from back. huntington west virginia so i'm in louisville kentucky so we competed Vogel trained me. So Vogel's a two-time gold medalist, 1976. And Vogel trained me the year before the Olympic Games in 92. Okay, great. And uh, so I got, I got some of the Vogel magic, and, and, and he, was, he, he was a pivotal point. But, yeah, he, uh, he's a good butterflyer, obviously, as, as you were. <laughs> he knows what's going on. The, um, so we were, we've been talking about you. I imagine your ears have been burning. We were talking about basically, we went, you know, I sat down to dinner and I realized in 2008 that this is a special family. And then, so anyway, I'm catching, I'm catching Mr. Burkle back up for anybody listening right now. But basically, it's uh, real, real super tight, deep roots. So how old is, is this story club? Uh, Lakeside or? Yeah. Well, Lakeside's 1920s. 1928, I think. Yeah. So it's been near 100 years coming up. Near but when Dad years. swam there, I think it, I believe it still had a you know a mud bottom. Um, well, I, yeah, it wasn't chlorinated when we started. I started swimming in '63, I think, and um, it wasn't chlorinated, and it probably didn't get chlorinated until around 1980 or so. So you used to not be able to see your hand in front of your you know face. Um, and of course, we didn't have goggles back then either. And uh, then they coronated. There were all these myths and stories that it was, you know, 50 feet deep and there were monsters in the bottom. And then they <laughs> chlorinated and it's like 10 feet deep and you could see everything. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's beautiful. Good. Have you been there, Mel? I have. I have been there. I've been a guest of Mary T. Um, my wife and I was up, we were up a, a few years ago for the, the, the tier sprint oh. meet. Oh, that's right. Um, but love, love the town. Gorgeous area. But I, so I was up with Mary T, but I was, I've been to Louisville. Um, I've been, I've been all over Kentucky. And of course, I'm, you know, University of Tennessee alum. So yeah, sure. I, I, I know the areas. Yeah. All right, so here's, here's Caroline, the you know, Caroline went to graduate school at Tennessee. I was and absolutely I, it just fell in love with it. Well, so here's, here's a, here's a final question for dad. And then we're going to bring it back to Clark. Yeah. I got so, what what advice do you have for for parents trying to produce two Olympians in one family? <laughs> go. That's pretty good. I have. Yeah. Uh, I hope that the mother has, is a really good athlete, like the girl I married. <laughs> <laughs> it never hurts. 
She can beat me at golf, tennis. I think I beat her once at tennis and she was nine months pregnant and I drop shot at her. But, you know, I got that to live with. So, good to see you, Mel. Good to see you. I'll be outside. Yeah. Yeah. See you. Clark's father making the special guest appearance. We're bringing it back to Clark. We're going to swim nerded up. We're going to we're going to screen. We're, we're going to get we're going to get down to the drama. The, so you did you did three years at Florida, and then you 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 moved. And I I gotta be honest with you, buddy. I I don't know the backstory behind that, or if you can share it, or if you want to push off on it. But it seems like it it, it turned out to be a positive things for you. You went to the University of Florida, finished your senior year at, at Arizona. Uh, do you want to share a little bit behind what was going on there? Yeah, I mean, it's a, you know, there's probably a couple of different stories that have floated around out there. I, you know, I'd, I guess the best place to start is growing up. I had um, attitude issues uh, and not like poor attitude where I didn't want to be there, but poor attitude like a temper tantrum or, um, you know, just insubordinates or, you know, low coachability, I'd say. And you can ask Mike DeBoer about that. I mean, I don't think I was a bad swimmer to coach, but you'd tell me some 25 times and I'd do it my way. Um, and as we all know, Coach Troy is, uh, is a great coach. I mean, I can say that with all honesty. I mean, he's produced more Olympians and tremendous athletes than a lot of people. And I, I have a lot of respect for him, but him and I were like fire and ice. Um, and a lot of that, I'd say I can attribute to how immature I was and just how um, I think spoiled and babied I'd become uh, at Lakeside, just being kind of the only guy that was really at, at a higher level. Uh, and when I got to Florida, you know, I just, it, I didn't, I didn't adapt all that well. And so I struggled some with um, the feedback that coach Troy provided. I struggled some with his coaching style. I struggled some with, um, you know, where he put me in certain groups. You know, I was in IM out of high school. I think I was, you know, 1800 national champion one year in the Florida IM at national. And I was pretty, you know, I was pretty good at IM and like, I hadn't really developed into a breaststroker yet. And so I had always wanted to swim breaststroke and Troy always wanted me to be a distance guy. And, uh, you know, more times than not, I was just like folding in these like important situations. And, and a lot of it was just because I just couldn't, you know, I'd get, stubborn and I just wouldn't perform and he had these really high hopes for me which were understandable given how good my sister was and the way that I could train and so I kind of um, I wouldn't say I let him down I'd say I more so let myself down in that process but at the same time I sort of developed this like negative attitude which um, wasn't helpful for the team wasn't helpful for myself and so you know I kind of went in and out of that had some moments that I did really well you know like my junior year or sorry, my sophomore year I swam really well um, Junior year, I did okay. Sophomore summer was decent at trials. You know, I made a handful of A finals and, you know, wide variety of events, which was cool. But I kind of was sitting there in my head thinking, like, there's no way in my best events I'm ever going to make the team. It's the IMs. Like, you know, I don't know, I'm like 4 17 or 18 or something like that and was well behind Tyler Clary. And I'm like, he'll make it before I ever make it in those events. And honestly, you know, no offense, Tyler, I don't think you're ever going to make it in those events because you got Michael and Ryan. And so I was like really kind of hell bent on getting out of uh, the IMs in distance because I'd done so well in the tuna breast that summer. And I just didn't know how to communicate, right? Like I was like your typical younger kid. I would just bottle it up, get pissed off, you know, throw a tantrum, loaf of practice, you know, get in an argument with coach. And like, I never stood up for myself in a way that was actually decipherable by coach Troy. Never really represented myself um, in what my goals were, what, what I really wanted to get done in a way where him and I could actually reach an agreement. So I think that really hurt me. And so fast forward to 2009 uh, world trials, I'd um, foregone the uh, world university games team. Cause I thought I could make the world championship team. Cause it was summer after the Olympic trials. And I was like, I'm going to make it in these spacesuits. I'm a, you know, dumpy guy. I'm going to put this thing on and I'm going to be like a laser underwater. And I couldn't get the damn thing on cause my legs were too big. And like, I was all uncomfortable and this and that and blah, 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 whatever, whatever. Uh, you know, I ended up that first day I was entering the 400 IM and the 100 breast and um, I really didn't want to do the 400 IM. I think I drew like out of prelims, maybe like fourth. And I think Ryan might have been second. Um, and I just like gave up so hard that night. Um, I gave up so hard because I was so mad that I was doing that when I thought that I should do the 100 breast instead and I could break a minute in that suit. And again, I hadn't never clearly communicated that. I just had, you know, it's this dream in my head. 
Um, and I kind of just flamed out in both. And then Coach Troy and I had an exchange down on deck. This was at IEPUI, and I um, I punched a bleacher just straight down, like boom. And I still have, I mean, my finger won't sit. I broke my hand. I broke my finger. You know, I was, it's a total clown move. You know, he kind of like, he just walked away. I remember I went up to like that um, hallway, the four-year up top there at IEPUI, and I saw my mom and my fingers like hanging down. I'm just like, what happened? I'm like, oh, I, I smoked it and on my back to breast turn. And my dad just looks at me and he goes, you weren't going that fast. He's like, that was the slowest, <laughs> that's the slowest race you've ever done. He's like, there's no way you did that. And I was like, oh, no, I did, whatever. My mom just kind of looked at me. And we've always had this bond because she's pretty stubborn too. Um, and she just knew I was lying. Uh, so, you know, my dad ended up taking me to the, to the ER. They ended up putting a cast on my hand, like a soft cast that night. We got the x-rays back. It was broken. The next day, I actually went back to Louisville, got an actual cast. And then this was just the cherry on top. Um, well, my mom knew I was lying, so I saw, you know, broke down crying, told her I was lying, told her I punched whatever. She's like, you're leaving Florida, like, you can't handle it, you're not mature enough, blah, 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 you know, all the stuff moms say. But my dad made me go back and watch finals the last night of the meet to watch the 200 breast. And he just looked at me, and he said, that should be your spot. And then Martin Wilby looked at me, and he said something similar. And I was just like, you know, I need to, like, figure my my – stuff out um at which point then i just decided like from a mental health perspective and from like really just wanted to blaze my own path like get out of florida start over get away from my sister you know stop living in her shadow stop living in ryan's shadow as far as training goes and um and just like go somewhere else and so then i uh you know told coach troy which was like a pretty painful process and um I talked to a couple different schools. I think I talked to Eddie at Texas, uh, Frank at Arizona, um, reached out to Stanford, didn't hear back. <laughs> um, and then Cal, Dave Durden at Cal. And that, you know, really came down between Cal and Arizona because Texas, I guess I was too far along with my major. I, I don't know if that's like a real thing or not, but at the time I wasn't going to challenge it. But at the time they had the best pressure group, right? They had Scott Spann, they had Eric Chanteau. They had, I mean, they had like, they had the group. So then I took these recruiting trips and like Arizona was just a blast. We had a great party. The sunshine was bright. The girls were pretty. Um, the bushes were cool. And um, you know, my old friend, Corey Chitwood was my host. I mean, I just had a blast. And so I was like, I'm going to do this and ended up transferring. It took a while to get my release and, um, you know, got started out there. I'd say really, I mean, this all happened in like a couple of, weeks so it's kind of a that's a roundabout way to to describe it that's really what led me to change I mean it was just um you know I'm, I'm happy that I actually did it I had the the guts to do it but I'm also like very regretful of the way that I handled myself during the entirety of the situation because it was not only embarrassing but it was damaging for my my reputation amongst a bunch of coaches and um it had nothing to do with who I was it had everything to do with with getting away from who I was acting like I was right. Like this spoiled, immature kid uh, and just like punting him out the window and like deciding like almost like that scene in cool runnings uh, where junior Bevan sitting there with um, whatever the baldy guy's name is. And he's like, tell me who you see. You know, it was like kind of one of those things, right? Like I was always just, just the huge like baby and kind of grew out of it in that moment. Um, at least swimming wise. So yeah, that's, sort of it <laughs> put the put the put the cherry on top I, I i i i you're a good guy so and uh honorable guy i got a lot of character so um time passes and then you then you see greg on deck again yeah. <laughs> you don't have to share what happened but i mean it's uh i i've had buddy i've had these moments where i've not handled relationships well and i see somebody later and i have to talk to them. what was that like I mean, it was, I mean, it's a good question because like, I, I don't truly remember what it was like at NCAAs. I just remember, um, cause I didn't see him again cause I was totally out of conference and you know, I thought about it a lot. I thought a lot more about like what maybe was being said about me in the locker room at Florida because I never really settled things with anybody. And I, and I regretted that because I really liked almost every one of my teammates, you know, um, and had a ton of respect for them. And so 
that was probably what hurt me the most was just thinking about, you know, how much I let those guys down and how I would have to see them again. You know, guys like Connor Dwyer, Sean Frazier. I mean, these were, Connor was just starting to explode, but like he lived with me that entire summer or like didn't live with me, but spent like pretty much every day with me. We became pretty good friends. And so like, I was, I was embarrassed, you know, I felt stupid, but when I saw Troy, I mean, I think I don't even really exchange any words, knew it was coming, but probably the, I don't know if funny is the right word, but maybe, maybe ironic's better, but um, the Arizona parent section was sitting right above Florida's uh, student section at NCAAs. So was there a McCorkle? And, and I won in a, you know, blazingly slow 153.19 and popped up out of the pool, like Jack in the box, stood on the blocks and, and flexed, you know, like, ah. And my parents were sitting right above Troy, so I, like, did it at the Arizona parent section. <laughs> and everybody thought I was like doing it at, at Troy, you know, and I was like, no, I didn't even, I didn't even put two and two together, but, um, I, I guess it looked cool, but, you know, fast forward even more so to uh Olympic training camp because he was my coach. And I mean, we, we chatted some, I don't think we ever had like an in-depth conversation, but honestly it was like, I, uh, I really wanted him to be, to be proud of me. You know, I still kind of had that, like, I'm sure you, you hear people talk about this with many coaches, especially Troy, but they really want to please him. You know, they really want him to be proud of what they've achieved just because, um, you know, he does, he is incredibly passionate about what he does. Right. And so like, I just wanted him to, to like, at least acknowledge the fact, like I wanted to look at him and be like, Hey, I did make it. Like you weren't wrong. I could have been good, but like maybe we just met each other at the wrong time type scenario. Right. So, so, I mean, we like, we get along fine and everything. It's just, there's not a lot of depth to it. Um, I actually wrote a note, uh, to coach nasty and I, I still want to write one to Troy, but I wrote one to coach Nessie just kind of apologizing for, for how mature I was. Cause I always really respected that guy. I mean, uh, you know, him well, obviously, but you know, he always stuck up for me and um, would talk to me about stuff. And, and I've seen Martin a couple of times too. And um, so it's been, you know, it's been fine talking to those guys. I'm so far removed now, but like in 2012, I mean, it was Troy treated me with respect and um, you know, treated my family with respect too. So it was fine. when we saw each other. It's definitely just, Maybe a little awkward at first. <laughs> so you handled it. Yeah. Handled yeah. It, we handled it. Um, I did hear that he said one time that, you know, he's like, oh, just typical Clark. You got lucky and won a slow event at NCAAs. And I was like, damn. But I was like, look, I can't really debate that. I mean, it really wasn't the fastest event. But at the time, uh, the, the time wasn't too far off. Um, I believe Brendan Hansen still held the American record at 151.7 ish and so it wasn't that we went 152 in the morning i'll say that <laughs> now it's like it doesn't even make the a final so whatever having the title nc2a champion is is uh i, I think that's all that matters that, that is a yeah. points meet and uh success is a great disinfectant yeah it is it's a good it's a good way to put it <laughs> No, 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 it works. It's, um, here's the thing. If you'd been coached by Coach Mel Stewart and Coach Coleman Hodges, we would have known. No offense to Greg, but we would have been like, hey, buddy, you're too buff to do a 400 IM. Yeah. There's no way this guy. Very restricted, yeah. This is like, this is, guys, this, you're like the bodybuilder on deck. So we have to ask you, just, you know, the elephant in the room is, you're buff, buddy. Where, where does this buffness come from? I mean, like, and, you, and you maintain it. Every time I see you, it's like, he still got it. Yeah. Well, you, I mean, I guess I have it, or it looks as if I have it visibly when I'm wearing clothes. But let me tell you something: when my shirt comes off and I pop in for the occasional master's practice, there's a nice little fat tire developing around the bottom of my stomach. But um, I, you know, my dad's very muscular. Uh, his dad's very muscular. My mom is, um, she's athletic and she's got a bigger build. Um, you know, she's five seven, five eight, but she's strong. And, uh, you know, our, I guess our heritage is German, Irish, and English. Um, and as my mom puts it, big boned. I mean, right now I'm probably 235, 240. My body fat's higher, but um, I still feel pretty fit. I mean, I can still throw down if I need to. <laughs> but I don't work out as much as I'd like. But I don't know. There was a – I started off, honestly, like kind of chubby and fat as a kid. Um, you know, my – my my nickname was Bubble Butt when I was younger amongst my sister's friends. Um, I once had chanted at me, tacos, burritos, what's coming out of your Speedos. Um, <laughs> when I got to Florida, 
I was nicknamed Bubba for a while. Um, it took me a long time to transition from like chubby, you know, bigger kid to like putting actual muscle on. And then I don't know honestly what it was, but it's like there was a certain moment where I, I feel like I just really was able to hold muscle, put muscle on and, and just got a lot bigger. It was like when I, when I grew, I didn't necessarily get taller. I just, um, the composition of my body changed a lot. And I think that was probably around like the time I went to Arizona because of my yardage dropped substantially. Um, the type of yardage I was doing was a lot more anaerobic and just specific to what I was racing. And the, the lifting just totally changed a lot more complex lifts. Not that we didn't do that at Florida, but it was, um, you know, the volume was so high there. There were very few people that could really keep mass on. Um, and, and so I think it, it changed then, but I, I don't know. I mean, my sister's strong too. My little brother's an ox. I mean, he can one point in time, that guy could probably bench press 225, 30 times. I mean, he's just a big, big, big kid. He plays rugby at UK. Uh, so, I mean, that's never been an, an issue. I think it's almost one of those things where it's like you're, you're doing so much swimming that it's hard to see like how strong you can get. Right. And now that the cardio has gone down, some, some other things have gone up, but, but yeah, I, you know, I, I, and I just enjoyed, I enjoyed like that lifestyle a bit more than the uh, distance I am, you know, 80,000 meters plus a week at, at Florida. But I will say, and I think if you ask Troy this, like I could really practice, I could do some good and I still can like that. I love that having that sneaky distance side. So a lot of people don't remember it, you know, so I, but. Before, before you came, we're down to seven minutes because your dad just came in. Yeah. And I, I, up the middle part of this pod. Yeah. I just want to let you know that you can, <laughs> you can give a hard time later. Before you were coming on, Coleman and I were talking and I'm like, Coleman, you know, what are the hidden nuggets here? And I think he uncovered one of them. Uh, and this is an alumni meet. Can you talk about that a little bit, Coleman? What, what do you know about this legendary rimmer? So, so uh, if you don't know, Clark used to live in Austin, where Mel and I live now. And uh, Clark and I used to swim at the same master's team. That's right. And I heard through the grapevine, Clark would come in. I'm like a mediocre swimmer and Clark would come in and just like blast by everyone in practice. He'd come like once every month. He'd be like, Hey guys. And then just like lap everyone. <laughs> it's dude. He, he he's, he's one of the not good at morning. Practices. I don't like waking up early, <laughs> yeah. but I heard through the grapevine that you went to an Arizona alumni meet and dropped like it may be in like 2016 or 17 or something and dropped like a 5,300 breaststroke. Is this true? <laughs> and beat quarters. <laughs> and beat uh, yeah, it, quarters. It, it's true. I don't think Kevin did. I think he, he might've pulled out. I mean, I, I put on a jammer. I did have a beard though. Um, I think I went 53 low. Honestly, the mo the best part, this is like my, um, God, who's that? I forget the guy's name that has the story. The baseball player like flew cross country and drank all the case of beer on the plane. I played around a round of golf that day with my buddy, John Basson. Actually, Cordis was there to a couple of other guys. I, I probably, you know, this across, you know, four hours. So I probably had eight or 10 drinks, ate a couple hot dogs. So we went to the pool afterwards um, at the resort, hung out, maybe hit the swim up bar. I got to the meet. Um, I did, about a 75 and I just I just know too well how to do to do a good pull out and, and you know hit the turns and I, I think I got kind of lucky I was really jacked up swimming in front of the old uh, crowd to the old coaches and and being back in, in Tucson being outdoors so it's true but I tried to I tried to downplay it a little bit because I don't know when the next time I'll actually put a suit on and race is and I don't want any expectations <laughs> <laughs> you can always do a 50 buddy yeah exactly <laughs> you, can, you can always pop you can always pop a 50 go ahead Coleman I'm sorry <laughs> I mean, he can always do freaking 500 I mean you talk about you know you you always being able to <clears throat> have that distance background I know we have a mutual friend in Jack Brown you trained yeah. with him at Arizona mm -hmm. I, I coached with him in the zoo he's a associate head coach at North Carolina now with Mark Gangloff yeah. um t talk to me about you know he he said you guys would just grind out pole sets yeah and uh, at what when you guys were at Arizona and you guys would just go back and forth and in those days you know again uh, you were coming you were coming down but you guys were kind of both distance IMers um, yeah. tell me about one or two of those sets that you guys had fun with 
I, I, even before I say that, I mean, I remember Jack uh, from Zones in San Antonio. He he went 442 in the 400 IM. We were 12. Um, and, I mean, he was like – I don't know if he was first top 16, but he was like one of the top guys. And, I mean, we had Ricky Barons, Brooks Stovall, Scott Spann, Jack Brown, Eugene Godso, David Paget. I mean, it was like just this loaded zone. And so since that moment, I was like, God, I want to be Jack Brown because he just smoked me. And um, – and he went to Arizona and, you know, we always kind of competed and stuff and, you know, all the time. And even he, he got rookie of the meet at nationals. I think mean, like um, 426 out at Stanford um, when I, I think it was, maybe I was the junior, it was, it was 2004. But anyways, I, you know, I always had a lot of respect for him, but he always beat me. He really always beat me. And so we do these practices and like, you know, Jack and I, we were friends. We didn't always like get along, not because we didn't like each other, but because we were just like competing nonstop. And we probably get on each other's nerves, but we would just battle. Um, we used to do these, I, I mean, a couple of things, like distinct things. We used to pull brush up with paddles and Jack would just absolutely destroy me. Um, he was so good at brush up with paddles and I couldn't figure out why. And I'd ask Rody and Rody would just laugh at me and tell me to keep up with him. <laughs> and I remember we used to do this uh, during taper. We used to do this, do a couple of things. And one of the things we do a hundred freestyle from a push and I believe it was three, two, one, zero breathing by 25. And Jack could push like a 45 or 46 and I couldn't push under a 49. And, and like, I would just sit there and be like, he's just going to kill me. He's going to absolutely beat me so bad. His endurance is insane. Like we're going to come down that last hundred. It doesn't matter if I beat him on the breaststroke. Like I can't, I'm not going to be able to do it. Um, and I, of course I never tell him that, but, <laughs> but we had, we went back and forth. And I mean, roadies, I am training was a lot of, there wasn't anything really ever that long. And never really anything above a couple hundred yards, but there was a lot of faster, shorter interval stuff, you know, making sure you went out to 15 yards or 15 meters off each wall. And Jack could just do that stuff like clockwork. He's really, really, really good and tough at it. Um, so he, you know, he pushed me a lot, but honestly, like when I got out there, I was so ready to be done with the 400 I am. I was like more concerned. I was like, I can't let Jack beat me in the tutor press because <laughs> he was like surging at breaststroke. And I was like, God. <laughs> But yeah, we had some we had some good battles. It was always fun racing him. We got to bring you back because we're running out of time. We got to talk a little bit about the Olympics, the Olympics experience. We also have to bring you back because we need some, some breaststroke knowledge. We're lean on that. Will you come back on the pod? Sure. Yeah. All right, buddy. Yeah, Any final thoughts? Fun. Parting thoughts in twenty seconds. Parting thoughts in twenty seconds. Um, I just hope that everybody's got a pool out there that's training for the trials. I hope that the trials go off and they're not too logistically crazy that it makes the athletes uncomfortable. I hope that the Olympics do happen, even though I know they've stated that, or, you know, the Japanese and the IOC, I guess, have stated it will happen no matter what. But, um, you know, swimming is an exciting and fun sport, especially in the Olympic year. And I think we all deserve to see that bring everybody together. Uh, and just watch some really, really fast swimming, especially for all of us swim nerds out there that look for that is kind of their moment to really enjoy the sport again and see it on international broadcast. <laughs> so those are, those are my hopes. Those are my parting thoughts. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcasts on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.